I love the way they say that, cosmic skeptic. Um, in the opening chapters of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, we're introduced to a cruel elderly pawnbroker named Aliona Ivanovna. Um, she's a, a nasty woman in the book who will eventually become the subject of a proposed murder. The anti-hero of the novel, Raskolnikov, is in a local bar when he overhears two strangers talking about the pawnbroker. And they discuss her nature, how she ruthlessly forecloses on her patron's debts, how she physically abuses her sister, how the world would be a better place without her. And the conversation moves towards the subject of killing her. And this conversation between the officer and the student turns to this subject of murdering the pawnbroker. And the officer says to the student, tell me, would you kill the old woman yourself? And the student responds, no, of course I wouldn't. I was just arguing for the justice of it. It's nothing to do with me. The officer responds to this with something quite insightful, in my view. He says, well, if you ask me, if you wouldn't do it yourself, then there's no justice to speak of. Quite regularly, we allow other people to do things on our behalf that we would never want to do ourselves. This isn't always a sign of hypocrisy, of course. Uh, maybe I allow somebody to clean my gutters because I think it would be disgusting to do it myself. Or I might pay for somebody to perform tricks in a circus despite never wanting to step into danger myself. But if the reason why I wouldn't perform a particular action is because I have some ethical reservation about doing so, because I think it would be immoral, then I think it would be strange and probably hypocritical for me to pay for somebody else to do it on my behalf. And I think this is what Dostoevsky is driving at with this quote. This makes some sense. Imagine I said that it was immoral to thieve, but then you found out that I was paying for somebody to steal things for me. Imagine I claimed that the production of pornography was grossly unethical, but then you found out that I was paying for a premium subscription. I think it would be fair to say that I was acting hypocritically and probably don't actually hold to the ethical propositions that I claim to believe in. Realistically, if you caught me paying for someone else to do something that I think is immoral enough to prevent me from doing it myself, there are only two things that I can do to acquit myself of the charge of inconsistency. I must either admit that I don't think these things are actually unethical at all, or I must stop paying for somebody to do them on my behalf. If consistency is my goal, I cannot keep paying for someone to do something for me that I would have an ethical reservation about doing myself. I think then that when we're analysing the justice of a particular behaviour, we can begin by asking a fairly simple question. Would you do it yourself? And if not, why not? This in mind, I want you to picture a scene and tell me what you would do in this situation. You're stood before a cow on a modern industrial factory farm. The cow stares at you blankly. She doesn't understand what's about to happen, but you can tell that she's conscious, she's aware of her surroundings, she's perceptive. You're told that you must do the following. First, you are to restrain her in a small cage known colloquially as a rape rack. Then you must force your arm into the cow's anus, grappling the cervix through its lining before injecting her with the semen of a bull. This will cause the cow to become pregnant, and when her calf is born, you must shortly afterwards separate that calf from her mother, dragging them apart and trying to ignore the panicked wails and, and, and distress when you do so. And you must also drive away fast enough to stop the desperate mother from running after a calf. You're told to lock the calf in a solitary confinement hutch and to mutilate her horns with a hot iron or chemical erosion. As for the mother, you're told to repeat the earlier process until she no longer produces milk, at which point she is described as spent. At this point, you send her to an abattoir where you are told to force a metal bolt into her skull, hang her upside down, and slice open her throat. 
If she's still pregnant when you kill her, by the way, then you have to leave her hanging long enough to starve the fetus of oxygen. But if the fetus has fallen out during the butchering process, as sometimes happens, then you're told to bludgeon the fetus to death with the blunt object of your choice. This is the task ahead of you. So back to my earlier question, would you do this? Would you perform these acts of astonishing animal cruelty? Most of you probably wouldn't. I know I would certainly refuse. And I wouldn't just refuse because I can't be bothered or because it's a bit gross, but because I think this list of commands is unethical and result in the unjustified abuse of an animal. Now, it's true that by inflicting this cruelty, that cow will produce milk for human beings to drink. But this doesn't change my assessment. After all, we have oat milk, almond milk, soy milk, hazelnut milk, a myriad of options that don't require the suffering of any animals in order to produce. And the milk that a cow produces is supposed to be for her own calf, just as human milk is meant for our own human children. When we steal a mother's child away from her, one of the most gruesomely unethical prospects imaginable, so that we can drink her milk, something that we don't need to do, it seems like we've committed a gross violation. But this is exactly what you're being asked to do. Um, would you do it? Or would you refuse? Here's a new situation. Now you're stood in front of a piglet and you're told by a farmer that the piglet is too sick to be profitable. And so you have to take this animal by the hind legs and repeatedly smash the skull into the pavement until the piglet dies. It's well enough to rear for their flesh. Should also have their tails cut off and their teeth pulled out, and you're told to administer this without any anesthetic. You're then told to go to a slaughterhouse where the adult pigs are waiting. Here you must force the pigs into cages before lowering them into a gas chamber, wherein concentrated carbon dioxide will cause them to thrash around in confused agony until they're finally snuffed out. Would you perform this task? Would you force an intelligent, innocent creature into a gas chamber? Or would you think that this was too cruel? What if I told you it would taste really, really nice if we did it? Would that change anything? Well, taste is just one of our five famous senses, just like hearing is, or touch, or smell. And if I wouldn't force an animal into a gas chamber because I like the way it sounds, then why would it be okay to do it because I like the way that it tastes? Once again, I predict that most of you would flatly refuse to participate in any of this. And once again, not just because you can't be bothered, but because you think that this kind of behavior is unethical, unjust, cruel. And following our earlier logic, it would seem that if this kind of animal abuse really is unjust, then we should refrain not just from doing it ourselves, but also from paying anybody else to do it on our behalf. Yet these exact practices the ones that I've just described, the rape racks, the gas chambers, the cages, the maternal separation, the blunt force trauma, all of these are industry standard practices on modern factory farms. And these are the farms that produce well over 95% of the animal products that we consume. This means that every time we buy a food that comes from one of these farms, we're paying for somebody else to visit this unimaginable cruelty upon animals on our behalf. Cruelty that could be entirely avoided if we simply choose to eat something else. You may be surprised to learn that this is what happens on factory farms. We're often sold an image of animals happily running around in a big green field somewhere before finally being painlessly and quickly killed. It's true that farms like this can exist in principle, and there will be many in the world that do. But such farms make up a vanishingly small minority of our current food production. Over 95%, as I say, of animal products we consume come from factory farms, which don't resemble these natural conditions in the slightest. Factory farming, with its concrete and its cages, its confinement, its cruelty, are now very much the norm, with so-called happy farms very much the exception. The upshot is that every time we buy animal products, 
from a coffee shop or a supermarket or a fast food joint, almost every single time, we're funding factory farming, not some local ethically sensitive farm. Of course, you could go out of your way to make sure that you only ever eat food that comes from non-industrialized farms, but in a modern city, this will be a huge and expensive inconvenience and will prevent you from eating out almost anywhere. So what can we do? If we think the kind of animal cruelty that I described earlier is unjust, and we wouldn't inflict it ourselves, then we shouldn't be paying for somebody else to do it, and therefore shouldn't be eating factory farmed animal products. But eating you know, locally sourced, traditionally reared animal products is a huge and expensive inconvenience. So what can we do? Right? Even if these animals are treated horribly, we need to eat something. But the good news is that there is actually a third option available to us, eating plants. You may be surprised to learn that every single nutrient required to live healthily can be found on an adequately planned vegan diet without requiring any animal products at all. And that does include protein and vitamin B12. Becoming a vegan is thought by many to be a radical, extreme step. This is certainly the case in my own country, but here in France, the perception of vegans is even worse. It seems to require a, a huge inconvenience, a complete change in our diet and eating foods that are just miserable and bland. It also seems to require growing out your hair and taking up yoga and throwing red paint at people wearing fur coats. But this simply isn't the case. All of your favorite foods, whether it's pizza or burgers or curry or burritos or pasta, they're all now available in plant-based form. If you like eating steak or fish or chicken, you'll be amazed at how close the vegan alternatives have come to mimicking the taste of these products and by how much protein you can get from a plant-based source. If you like junk food, I can introduce you to vegan chocolate, crisps, candy, all of this kind of stuff. It's all available. I, I must say that when I first came to France, I was overjoyed when I found out that your language allows you to market your vegan cheese as fromage, which I think is perhaps the greatest French invention since the metric system. Given how easily we can obtain nutrients that we require to be healthy without harming any animals, harming animals for food can therefore only be described as completely unnecessary. And the infliction of unnecessary, wanton suffering is a good definition of cruelty. I'd imagine that every person in this room would say that they're against animal cruelty, would you not? The fact that avoiding animal cruelty in factory farms is perceived as radical or extreme only speaks to how ethically warped our current perceptions are. If veganism is radical, it's an exercise in radical compassion. If veganism is extreme, it's a vote for peace in an extremely violent industry. I understand, of course, that while in principle eating plants is incredibly easy, it can, depending on where you live or specific health issues or even the family that you live with, be quite impractical and difficult to, to live out in your real life. But that's why the definition of veganism is not, as some people think, an elimination of animal products from your diet. The definition of veganism is rather this, an exclusion to the highest extent possible and practicable, all forms of animal exploitation and cruelty. It's about minimizing our contribution to the suffering of animals as much as it is possible for us to do so. If it's not possible to eliminate animal products entirely from your diet, perhaps because it's difficult where you live or you're still with your parents, perhaps you struggle with an eating disorder, all that veganism asks of you is to minimize your consumption of these products to the highest extent that you practically can, where there is a choice, in other words, between harming an animal and not harming an animal. We should choose to not harm that animal every time we can. After all, if I were paying to inflict this cruelty upon dogs or cats, most of my friends and family would probably disown me, even if I told them that I was doing it because I liked the taste of their flesh. But swap that dog for a pig, an equally intelligent creature, or the cat for a cow, and not only will they fail to condemn me, but they'll join me in paying for billions of these animals to undergo 
this cruelty, this obscene treatment every single year so that we can, what, keep having bacon and eggs, keep having milk in our coffee. Perhaps if someone was in a situation where they genuinely needed, for whatever reason, to eat dog meat in order to be healthy or to survive, people would understand and they'd say that it's ethically justifiable. But this in no way means that in a situation where I don't need to kill and eat dogs in order to be healthy, that this gives me some kind of ethical warrant to do so. If it's unnecessary suffering, then it should be avoided. Veganism is nothing more than an expansion of the generally accepted ethical proposition that we should avoid inflicting unnecessary suffering. It's just an expansion of this principle to encompass not just humans, but also non-human animals into our moral fold. And granting them even the most rudimentary ethical consideration should be enough to protect them against the obscenities of factory farming. My goal is twofold. It's firstly to try to convince you to choose a plant-based option wherever you can, but also to take a principled stance against factory farming on an industrial scale. I don't think this is a problem that can be best, most effectively solved by individual action alone, but individual action is, of course, the embryonic form always of large-scale industrial change. Some people describe the treatment of these animals as brutal, but since the root word of brutal is brute, meaning animal, I think there's an irony in using this term to describe what human beings are doing to brutes. In the brothers Karamazov, Ivan Karamazov complains to his brother Alyosha, saying that People often complain or uh, uh, well, they complain about man's bestial cruelty, is the word he uses. But he says that this is terribly unjust and offensive to the beasts, because a beast could never be as cruel as a human being. So artistically and picturesquely cruel. But this is why we have ethics in the first place, to overcome the crueler parts of our nature, to act in accordance with what we think is right, not what was once defended as natural. It makes no sense to examine injustices except from the perspective of the victim. If you were one of these animals in one of these cold, sanguinary farms, how much meat and dairy and eggs would you want people on the outside to be buying? Since I began this talk, over two million land animals alone have been needlessly slaughtered so that we can enjoy the taste of their flesh and secretions. And their death may have come as a mercy, given the treatment that they're forced to undergo while they're alive. All I'm asking you to do is to consider whether you would inflict this treatment yourself. And if you wouldn't, and to stop doing so indirectly by purchasing the resulting animal products. After all, as Dostoevsky wrote, and as I quoted at the beginning, if you would not do this yourself, if you would not inflict this cruelty, then perhaps that's simply because there is no justice in it. Thank you. <laughs>